And with me is Roberta La Barbera. She works in the um, systems unit here at UMass Amherst. So my name is Sheila Knesny. I'm the Associate Director of Financial Aid at UMass Amherst. Um, I've been doing financial aid for over 30 years. So um, I have quite a bit of experience. I've worked at a for-profit school. I've worked at Mount Hoyle College and I currently work at UMass Amherst as the Associate Director for awarding there. Um, I also have two children who have gone through the financial aid process. Um, my son graduated last year and my daughter is a sophomore. My son did, he went to Utica College in New York and played Division III soccer. And my daughter is a sophomore at Wagner College on Staten Island. She's in a five year physician assistant program and she plays Division I soccer. So not only do I have the, the financial aid, I've, I've gone through this process, I, I understand. How many of you, this is the first time going through the financial aid and admission process? Okay. Well, Roberta, can you fast forward to the third slide for me? You can do this. Okay. I know it seems a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot going on this year. Um, but if you're organized and you do some planning, um, you'll be fine. So let's go back to uh, the second slide. And I need to talk to you a little bit about MIFA. Okay. MIFA is the, the agency that organizes this presentation that I'm doing tonight. So the Massachusetts Education Financing Authority, um, their public service mission is to help families navigate this financial aid process so they have uh, speakers, we call ourselves ambassadors, and there's a whole legion of us that do this on a volunteer basis throughout the state, helping families navigate the financial aid process and have a really good understanding of, of what college financing is all about. Um, have, any, have any of you heard of MIFA before? Can I see a show of hands of those of you that have heard of MIFA? Okay, so that's great. So let's go back to the, let's go to the next slide and talk some more about you can do this. So I know at first it seems a little bit overwhelming, um, but just some tips that I can share with you is start the process early. So right now what you should be doing is make sure that you and your student has a federal pin to apply for financial aid. And you do that on fafsa.ed.gov and go out there and get your federal PIN. You will need that federal PIN to apply for financial aid. Um, the next thing that you can be doing right now is to make sure that you understand the financial aid application deadlines. I can't stress to you enough how important it is that you know what the deadlines are for each school and understand what their um, financial aid application processes as, along with what those deadlines are. Now what I did for each school that my son and daughter were applying for was to set up a folder. So get a separate folder for each school that they're interested in applying for. And, and start right now, you've got admissions information, you've got financial aid information. I don't know if there's any um, athletes out there, but you've got athletic information that you also need, and you've got different PIN numbers. Some schools will require um, PINs to get onto their school information. So the best thing that you can do right now is to set up a folder and keep all your financial aid documents in that folder for each school. I want to make sure that I remember all the points that I want to share with you because each each slide has so many different pieces of information and I don't want to skip any. So let's move on to the next slide. So here is a great, great, great resource for you. MIFA.org slash seniors. This is kind of like a one-stop shopping area for you in terms of accessing information. This is where you can link to both the federal financial aid application, the profile form, there's a scholarship search on here, there's all of the ebooks. So uh, along with this presentation is an ebook that you can download. Um, there's links to social media, so you want to make sure that you sign up for Facebook and Twitter because there's lots of information that MIFA will be putting out through those social media sites. 
Um, and there's fact sheets, there's calculators. This is a great resource for all of you. So make sure that you um, bookmark this website, uh, mifa.org slash seniors. So let's move on to the next slide. And let's go over what our agenda is for tonight. So we'll be talking about what financial aid is, how students apply, how the financial aid decisions are made, uh, financial aid awards, paying for college, and then free resources. I really love free resources. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So there's lots of different things on this slide for you to focus on. But I want you to start in the middle and focus on how much financial aid is available to families. $185.1 million. Um, and that's broken down into um, federal grants and scholarships, work study, um, state grants, institutional grants, and private employers. So this gives you an idea of how much financial aid is available to students out there. Now, uh, loans have to be repaid. No one's saying that you have to take out a student loan. You don't have to accept the loans or the work study. Work study is, is kind of a, a self-help form of financial aid that is available to families. Uh, gift aid obviously is the best kind of financial aid. The gift aid is the free financial aid that doesn't have to be repaid. Okay, Roberta, we can move on. So there are four different sources of financial aid, and each source has different requirements for eligibility. So we have the grants, the work study, the loans, um, and they can come to you from the federal government, they can come to you from the state. Examples of federal grants are the federal Pell Grants. Um, if you're a Massachusetts resident, you're eligible for a Mass Grant State Scholarship. Uh, let's talk a little bit about tuition waivers. There are many different tuition waiver programs in the state of Massachusetts. They can be need-based, they can be based on uh, uh, your academic ability. The John and Abigail Adams Scholarship is actually a need-based a waiver program that is based on merit. Um, they can be based on the fact that your parent is an employee of, of a state agency. Um, the important point to remember about these, these different tuition waiver programs that there are in the state of Massachusetts is you can only have one tuition waiver or up to the value of tuition. For example, at UMass Amherst, the value of tuition each semester is $857. It's not tuition and fees. So fees are, make, comprise a much larger portion. But the value of that waiver is $1,714 at UMass Amherst. Um, and you cannot stack them. So you can't have the John and Abigail Adams scholarship and a dependent tuition waiver and a veteran's tuition waiver and a mass rehab tuition waiver. Once you have reached the value of tuition, you're done. Okay. Um, the John and Abigail Adams, let me tell you a little bit more about that John and Abigail Adams. It is based on your 10th grade MCAS scores. And even though it is a, a merit-based tuition waiver, you still must fill out that financial aid application, the FAFSA form, each year. And that merit could be an athletic ability, it could be a musical ability, it could be an academic ability. Um, but the important point to remember about merit-based scholarships is there usually is a GPA requirement or some sort of requirement for that student to maintain. For example, the, the John and Abigail Adams scholarship, the student needs to maintain a 3.0 GPA. Um, I always like to talk about the fact that when my son was applying for admission at his school, he was awarded a freshman scholarship. And so the, you might want to ask the follow-up question, will that freshman scholarship last for four years or is it just a freshman scholarship or is that the name of the scholarship in my son's case it was the name of the scholarship so he was able to keep it for all four years but it's it's really important that that if that is part of the decision making process for you in terms of deciding what school you're going to attend you want to make sure that you understand that that gpa requirement 
um, if that's factoring into your decision financially to attend that school, that there usually is some sort of requirement for them to keep that merit-based scholarship. Um, it can also be based on uh, a nomination or an essay. They may have to write an essay. Um, there's all these different scholarships have different requirements for them, and I know they're seniors and they're very busy, and they but they just don't want to make sure they skip over some of these um, essays or other things that they have to do in order to get the scholarship because uh, those are the scholarships that sometimes are worth the most. Need-based financial aid will be based on a family's uh, financial aid eligibility determined by a standardized formula. For example, for the, the FAFSA form, we're using a formula that's known as federal methodology. So all the schools are applying the same formula to come up with that um, expected family contribution. Um, this includes for loans, grants, and work study, and also um, most of the financial aid, if not all of the financial aid that is awarded from the federal government and from the state of Massachusetts is need-based financial aid, except for that John and Abigail Adams tuition waiver. We can go on to the next slide. So let's talk about that FAFSA form. Okay, so the free application for federal student aid, it is required for all colleges. Um, you want to make sure that you, I have a paper FAFSA form with me if ever, anyone wants to look at it, but I really strongly don't encourage you to fill out that paper FAFSA form. You want to be filling out the FAFSA form online because there is built-in skip logic that makes sure that you are answering the questions correctly. So for example, if with the paper application, you could go through the entire paper application, mail it in, and four to six weeks later find out that you have made a fatal error on that application, and they will mail it back to you and tell you that you've made this fatal error and that you need to start all over again. But with the, the, the online application, you can't move on to the next section of the FAFSA form if you've made that same kind of fatal error that you would be making with the paper application. Um, you need to make sure that you are paying very close attention to the deadlines and you don't want to be waiting until your federal tax return. So if the deadline for applying for financial aid is February 1st, which is entirely re reasonable for some colleges, you want to make sure that you are estimating your information on that FAFSA form. There is a line for you to fill out that says, are you using your actual tax form from a, a completed tax return? Are you a non-filer? Or are you not filing right now, but you will file? So if, you're, if your application is due in February and your taxes for 2013 will not be completed yet, you want to fill out the section that says that you are estimating your information and then go back and make a correction to your FAFSA after your taxes are done. Um, this is where your PIN comes in. So remember in the beginning I, I said to you how you need to have a federal PIN? Your PIN is your electronic signature. So when you're filling out your FAFSA form online, when you get to the end of it, they'll be asking you for your federal PIN. And so you'll put in your PIN and that is the, the equivalent of your electronic signature. You're applying for financial aid every year, okay? We like to say at UMass, um, file your form by February 14th, Valentine's Day, send yourself a Valentine every year, make sure you fill out your FAFSA form. Don't self-diagnose yourself and your eligibility for financial aid. Remember I said to you, you need to fill out that FAFSA form for the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. It's not a need-based scholarship, but some scholarship programs will require that you complete a FAFSA form. So every year is a matter of practice. Make sure that you're filling out that FAFSA form. Um, what else can we say? So there is a big change this year as to who completes the FAFSA form. So if their parents are unmarried and living together, both parents would complete that FAFSA form. If you live in the state of Massachusetts and you are in a same-sex marriage, both parents complete that FAFSA form if they are living together. 
Um, that is a change. In the past, it was just the, the, the biological parent who filled out that FAFSA form. So uh, that is a big change for, next, for this next academic year coming up. Sure, I haven't gone over, I've forgotten anything. Let's talk about the, the IRS data retrieval tool. We haven't talked about that yet. So some of you will be selected for verification. And what the verification process is, is after you have submitted your federal application, um, a certain percentage of applicants get selected by the federal government for verification. And Part of that verification process is that you must submit your tax information to the financial aid office. And the easiest way to do that is with the IRS data retrieval tool. So it takes, um, it's available anytime after February 1st. And so for example, if you're filling out your FAFSA form with estimated information in February, and then on February 15th, you do your taxes. Two weeks after that, on March 1st, you could go back into your FAFSA form and change your information from estimated to actual. And if you qualify, you can use the IRS data retrieval tool. And so it will take you out to the federal uh, IRS website and you can upload your tax information directly onto your financial aid application and satisfy that whole process for submitting your federal tax return to the financial aid office. Um, it's by far the most efficient way for you to submit your tax information to the financial aid office. If you don't do or you can't do the IRS data retrieval tool, then you must submit an IRS tax return transcript to the financial aid office. Now the tax return transcript is different than a copy of your personal tax return. The IRS tax return transcript is a document that comes to us directly from the IRS. Um, I think this is the second year that we've been required to receive the IRS tax return transcript. And the whole notion of no longer accepting a personal tax return was the federal government was concerned that there was too much fraud with families submitting their personal tax return to the financial aid office. So that's why they offered up this process of the IRS data retrieval tool, which you can upload your tax information, or you can submit a copy of the IRS tax return transcript. Okay. Anybody got questions about that? I can see some. Excuse me? No. Well, it takes longer. He, the, the parent in the front row here is saying if you electronically file, the IRS data retrieval tool is available much quicker to you. That is true, but you still have the option of doing the IRS data retrieval tool, whether you file a paper uh, tax return or an electronic tax return. It just takes longer for it to become available if you're using a paper tax return. Oh, it is available, but it just takes longer for it to become available. If you file your taxes electronically, um, the IRS data retrieval tool is available two weeks later. Okay. Is there, so we've talked about it, requiring it to be completed every year. Um, you can't fill out your FAFSA form until after January 1st. So at the beginning of each year, um, you can fill out that FAFSA form. And you want to make sure that you're looking at what the deadlines are for each school. For example, at UMass Amherst, our deadline is March 1st. Um, and, and I can't stress to you enough how important it is that you follow deadlines. For example, at UMass Amherst, um, several years ago, the, the FAFSA filing deadline was really meaningless. We had enough financial aid to continuously award students grant and scholarship money, Roberta's shaking her head and going, it, it really was meaningless. All year long, the grants and the work study and the Perkins loans were available throughout the year to award students. And then one year in December, we ran out of grant money because there were just so many needy students applying for financial aid. 
And so every year we try to keep the, uh, the, the need to impose that March 1 deadline out there for uh, as long a time as possible before we start imposing the deadline. And I think this year uh, for incoming freshmen and transfer students, we didn't have to impose the deadline until the beginning of July. So students who applied for financial aid through the beginning of July, we still were able to award them an on-time award package. And when we talk about an on-time versus a late package, you're always going to be eligible for the federal financial aid funds, the, the loans and the Pell Grants. It's the institutional grant money that is at risk if you file late. So I think we can move on, Roberta. So um, the next slide is, is talking to you about the profile form. Some of the more selective colleges uh, will require applicants to complete the profile form. It's $25 to register for the first one, and then $16 for each additional school that you submit the, the profile form to. So there's much more information that is asked on that profile form, and it, it almost complements the information that's being asked on the federal financial aid application. It's much more detailed about your assets. They're going to ask you depending, and it's very customized. So when you're registering to fill out the profile form, um, it's very customized. So you might have a shorter version, or you might have a longer version, depending on, on how you're answering the questions but there's going to be much more information that's going to be asked of you, your personal and asset information on the profile form. And then some institutions will also have an institutional application. So I know this was the case when, when I worked at Mount Holyoke College, they had three different applications. They had the, the federal application, they had the profile form, and then they had an institutional application. So the, the best advice I can give you about completing all three of those forms is make sure that your answers are consistent. So one of the forms might ask you, like the profile form and the institutional application will ask you as parents, what do you believe you can reasonably contribute towards your son or daughter's education? And so you don't want to answer that question with something that's like zero because the, the primary responsibility for paying for college starts with the family. So you want to put something in there. But you also don't want to answer that question with something that is totally unreasonable because there's a good possibility that the school might take your totally unreasonable offer um, over and above what the calculated uh, expected family contribution will be. So you want to make sure that you're using a good educated um, decision when you're putting that information down. And make sure that your answers are consistent with all three forms because they will be making comparisons on what they asked you, what you answered, and how you answered on those three different forms. And you might be required to, to do some sort of follow-up um, if your answers are not consistent. Don't wait until you're accepted to apply for financial aid. So I think we talked in the beginning about making sure that you have a folder for each school. Make sure that just, as, just like you're looking at the admission deadlines, make sure that you're looking at the financial aid deadlines and what the financial aid application process is for each one of their school, these schools. There's no standard in terms of what the deadlines are or they can all require different forms. Some of them might require just the, the FAFSA form, the FAFSA and the profile, or maybe all three, the FAFSA, the profile, and an institutional financial aid application. Um, so it's just really important that you make sure that you're filling out all the required documents and do it as timely as possible. Um, another piece of advice, when you're filling out that common application for admission, the Social Security number is optional for the student. You do not have to list the social security number on the FAFSA form, on the, the common application. But if you have any intention of applying for financial aid, you want to make sure that you put that, that social security number down on that common application because that's how we're going to match up who the student is in the admissions office with who's applying for financial aid. Um, I know at UMass Amherst, 
uh, we need to make sure that the, the name, so you need to make sure that the name on the FAFSA form is the given name. Make sure that it's not a nickname. Make sure the, the name is John J. Jones, that your admissions application and your FAFSA form have John J. Jones. Um, make sure that you're not putting you, the parents, your date of birth, or your social security number, that is a really common error. You would be amazed at how many parents put their own social security number or their own date of birth. And then when they're applying for financial aid, that name in the admissions office isn't matching up with the name on the FAFSA form. So you wanna make sure that you're um, putting the correct information down on forms and you are disclosing what your social security number is on that common application. Okay, I think we beat that one done. So what happens after you apply? Okay, so after you apply for financial aid, um, you've listed, you have the ability on your FAFSA form to list 10 different schools. Um, and then if you have filled out your FAFSA form with a email address, so there is a place for you to put an email address. That's another tip. Make sure that um, you may want to even set up a new email address just for financial aid and admission information. Um, I know that's a, a really good thing that, that we did, was you set up a separate email address so your FAFSA information is coming back, all of the admissions follow-up stuff, the financial aid follow-up stuff is going to this one dedicated email address. It could be a Gmail account, a Hotmail account, um, a different charter email, but it's a dedicated email that you have for this college and admission um, follow-up stuff that potentially will be coming to you in the mail. Um, so if you've disclosed an email address on your FAFSA form, um, three to five business days after you've filled out your FAFSA form, you're gonna get an electronic student aid report sent to you, okay? You're also going to get um, an acknowledgement report from the profile form if you filled out the profile form. Now that student aid report form is your chance to review the information that you put down on your FAFSA form and make corrections to it. So if you filled out that electronic or that, that FAFSA form and there are errors on it or corrections that you need to make, this is your chance to do it because those, the financial aid offices that you've sent your FAFSA information to are gonna use the information that you put down on that FAFSA form to make an offer of financial aid to you. So if you've overestimated your income if you've underestimated your tax pay, if you need to add somebody else to the college size, all of those things have a, a important, every, every piece of information that you put down on that FAFSA form somehow plays a role in determining what your eligibility for financial aid is. So if you need to make corrections to your FAFSA information, I encourage you to review that student aid report and make corrections to your information so that when the financial aid office is making an offer of financial aid to you, it's as accurate as possible so that when you're making the decision about what school to attend, you're making the best informed decision based on financial aid that you can. Some schools will select you for verification. We talked a little bit about verification. So when you get your student aid report uh, electronically, it will tell you right on that form whether or not you have been selected for verification. Now verification, uh, once again, some schools will do 100% verification. What that means is they will verify every single financial aid applicant and ask for their tax information and verify the information that you submitted on your application. Some schools will only verify all of the incoming freshman class, so they do it once and then they're done. Um, at UMass Amherst, what we do is we verify the federally selected, so approximately 30% of the financial aid applicants will be selected for verification on an annual basis. And so we only verify the students that are federally selected for financial aid or if we're looking at their FAFSA information and something looks very conflicting to us, 
the institution can also select students for verification and ask to follow up and see their tax information. Okay. So um, when you're applying for financial aid, you're always using a previous year's tax information. So for the 2014-2015 financial aid award year, we're using your 2013 tax information. <clears throat> Um, sometimes that's not a good indicator as to what families can afford to pay for college. And so if you have special circumstances, you want to make sure that you follow up with the financial aid office um, about those special circumstances. For example, if you um, are applying for financial aid and in January um, someone loses their job, husband, wife, who knows, um, it could be or you're underemployed, not only maybe you don't lose your job completely, but your hours are declining at work. So that would be a special circumstance that the financial aid office will go back in at some point during that award cycle and take a second look at your eligibility for financial aid. And instead of using that base year, as we call it, the 2013 financial information, we would use your projected 2014 income and ask you, okay, so what do you anticipate that your earnings will be through um, uh, unemployment insurance? Um, every school has different requirements. Here I am again saying to you, there's nothing that's standard about this. So every school can have different requirements for going back in and taking a second look at your financial aid eligibility and doing what we call an appeal for financial aid, a second look at your eligibility for financial aid. So if your circumstances have changed, since you originally fill out your FAFSA form, you want to contact the school directly for them to take a second look at your eligibility for financial aid. Okay, we can move on to, um, let's talk about the cost of attendance. So the financial aid cost of attendance um, is a living budget. Think about it as a living budget for nine months. What is it truly going to cost that student to be a student at the college? So in addition to the tuition and fees and room and board, the direct expenses that a student pays to attend college, the financial aid office is always going to include the indirect expenses. Um, and those indirect expenses include books, travel, and personal expenses. Um, because we know that the student is going to travel back and forth from, from school at least four or five times during the academic year when the school is closed. Uh, we know that the student is going to spend, pay about $1,000 minimally for books. And then we put in about $1,000 of, at UMass Amherst, we put in $1,000 for personal expenses. For example, that student who is coming to UMass Amherst from California is going to need some winter clothing. Um, so the financial aid cost of attendance will always be inflated by those indirect expenses. So don't get confused when you're looking at um, some of these colleges' websites about the cost of attendance. The admissions office typically is only going to include tuition fees, room and board. But then if you look at the financial aid cost of attendance, which is really what you want to be looking at because that's what it's going to cost you out of pocket, the financial aid cost of attendance will always include those indirect expenses. Um, and this is something that you want to be thinking about when you're thinking about what schools your son or daughter um, are thinking about attending. So if they're thinking about attending a school that is a flight away from where you live right now, you want to plan on um, getting them there. They want to come home for Thanksgiving. They're going to come home between the fall and spring semester. They're going to leave for spring break for a week, and then you're going to have to bring them home in May. So think about what one round trip flight is going to cost you, times it by five, and add that on to the cost of attendance for those schools that they're thinking about attending that you know is the flight away from home. And then add in one more flight just for emergencies because there always seems to be an emergency. Okay, I think we can move on to the next slide. So let's talk about the um, expected family contribution. 
So the first thing we're going to do is calculate your expected family contribution. There's four components to the federal methodology for the expected family contribution. There's a contribution from the parent's income, there's a contribution from the parent's assets, and then there's a contribution from the student income and the student assets. So those four parts combine to be what's known as the expected family contribution. Um, it's not necessarily what the family will pay, but it's a benchmark that we're using in the financial aid office to calculate your eligibility for financial aid. And you'll see what that formula is in a couple of minutes. Now, uh, institutional methodology uh, is, is something a little bit different. They're, they may be looking at your tax return and not allowing um, a business loss. They may be looking at your tax return and making a calculation based on your interest income, what your savings is. Um, so the institutional methodology is a much harder look at your personal finances because what they're doing is they're thinking about who they're giving their institutional endowed scholarship money to. So they want to make sure that the, the right people are getting the, the, the funds. Um, so their formula is a lot different than the federal formula. They have much more leeway <clears throat> in making changes to your information on your personal tax return. I think we can move on. So uh, the big takeaway from this slide is that there, your personal debt is not a factor in determining what that expected family contribution is. It's a standard formula. We look at your total income. Uh, there's there's a, one of the questions on the FAFSA form will be, what is the date of birth for both of the parents? And what's happening with that question is they're calculating the age of the older parent. And based on the parent's age, the age of the older parent, um, there's an asset protection allowance that is built into the formula for, for parental assets. And so the younger the parents are, the, the more assets are available for college. The older the parents are, the more the assets are protected for retirement. So that's, that's a question or part of the formula that's built in. It's true. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so assets don't have anywhere near the impact on the formula that income does. And so this slide is just showing to you that, um, so you have family A, B, and C, and they all make $60,000. Family A has zero assets, family B has $75,000 in assets, and family C has $150,000 in assets. And you can see the change that um, that zero to 75, it only had a, a difference of $1,234. And the difference between family A and family C with zero to $150,000 in assets, the expected family contribution only rose to $6,588, okay? So the takeaway on this slide is, for those of you who have saved for college, thumbs up you're not going to be penalized. A lot of families have this myth that saving for college is bad, that it's going to somehow harm you when you're applying for financial aid. And so this slide is meant to, to um, take away that myth about saving for college. But however, income has a huge impact on eligibility for financial aid. So you see that income goes from 60 to 100 to $150,000 and the assets stay the same in all of these families. And you see that family A, the expected family contribution is $4,591. And family C, who's got $150,000, the expected family contribution is $32,000. So the income really is what's driving the bus on that expected family contribution formula. Okay? Okay, we can move on. So here's the formula that we're using. So we're taking that standard cost of attendance. Uh, remember that cost of attendance is tuition and fees, room and board, books, travel, and personal expenses. 
we're subtracting that expected family contribution because the primary responsibility for paying for college <coughs> begins with the family. So the first thing that will be calculated is that expected family contribution. So what's left is a student's need for financial aid. Okay, so the needier student, you can go back for one second. So if someone has, for example, uh, a zero expected family contribution, they're going to get a maximum federal Pell Grant. This year the maximum federal Pell Grant is $5,645. They're going to get a maximum Mass Grant State Scholarship if they live in the state of Massachusetts. The maximum state scholarship this year is $1,200. And then they're going to get institutional grant money. Um, that can range depending whether the student's in state, out of state, or residency plays a role in their eligibility for financial aid and grant money at UMass Amherst. Then they would get the maximum work study award for a freshman, that's $1,500. Um, we didn't really talk about work study and the benefits to work study. So work study is basically a campus job, and uh, it's a need-based work program. The benefit to students having that federal work study is, um, obviously, employers are only paying a percentage of their wages. Most of the wages are being paid out of the federal work study program. Departments on campus will have a small match um, along with that federal um, program. Um, so departments can hire three times as many work-study students as opposed to a non-work-study student. The benefit for the student is next year when they're applying for financial aid, any earnings that they have made through the federal work-study program are considered financial aid and don't get counted towards that student contribution from their income. So there's a benefit for them in the future. Um, and it helps them pay for those indirect expenses that we talked about that are factored into their cost of attendance. It gives them a bi-weekly check, for example, at UMass Amherst students are paid bi-weekly, and it helps fund those indirect expenses that we have factored into their cost of attendance. You've got your hand up. The maximum Pell Grant for the 2013-14 academic year is $5,645. So, um, so the, and then they will have a subsidized student loan. Freshmen are eligible for uh, $3,500 of a subsidized loan. What that means is the students are not paying any interest until after graduation. The federal government is subsidizing that loan for them. Okay. They might have a Perkins loan. A Perkins loan is uh, a need-based loan that gives them a 5% interest loan. They have a nine-month grace period after graduation on that loan program. And they might have an unsubsidized loan as part of their financial aid award. An unsubsidized loan is similar to the subsidized loan. It's a federal loan, but the federal government is not making the interest payment for the student while they're enrolled in school. The student is making that interest payment. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk about how the formula works. So we have um, a student here who has an expected family contribution of $5,000. And you see there are four colleges, college A, B, C, and D. So at college D, it doesn't cost much for that student to go to that school. So their eligibility for financial aid is zero because remember that formula, the cost of attendance, minus the expected family contribution equals that need for financial aid. So in this case, College D, the cost is only $5,000, and the student's expected family contribution is $5,000, so they have no need, okay? So they wouldn't get any financial aid at College D. College C, it costs $15,000, so they have $10,000 of need. And so if you go all the way up to College A, College A costs $45,000 to attend, and they have a $5,000 expected family contribution. So they have $40,000 of need at College A. So my point in this slide is do not apply, not apply to those more expensive schools because they may have more financial aid available to help you finance that expense. 
Um, don't self-diagnose your eligibility for financial aid. You have no idea what that financial aid award is going to bring to you until you submit your application for admission and until you submit your application for financial aid. And that's half of what you're doing right now is making sure that you have a good mix of public and private and high cost and maybe mid cost and low cost schools so that in March and April when you are trying to make that decision about financial aid, you've got some good choices and um, hopefully you've got some, you know, you've applied on time and you've gotten all your information in and so you really can't forecast what the schools are going to award you for financial aid um, because obviously your expected family contribution stays the same across all schools. It's the cost of the school that changes, therefore your eligibility for financial aid as well changes. Hmm, I wonder what this one's all about. So this is the slide I think that kind of loads it. You gotta keep. So we've got that cost. Oh, this is this is the barrel slide. That's right. They changed the barrel slide this year. This is one of my favorite slides. So the barrel slide um, is basically telling you a little bit about what I said a few minutes ago. So the first thing into the barrel is the expected family contribution. That always gets loaded into the barrel first. And then the next thing that gets loaded in is maybe merit scholarships. And then the next thing that gets loaded in is the grants. And then the student loans and the work study. And so we need to talk about unmet need here. So some schools will have unmet need. Remember, we're back to that formula, the cost of attendance minus the family contribution equals the need for financial aid. Not all schools are gonna meet 100% of the need that the student has. So there may be some unmet need. Um, that's need that the student has that the institution is not funding. Now, one of the questions that you want to make sure that you know the answer to for each of, school, each of the schools that you're applying to, because the answer can be different at every school, is how does the institution treat outside scholarships? So remember at the beginning, um, we talked about the scholarships that are available at Frontier High School. That would be what is known as an outside scholarship. And so every school can treat outside scholarships a little bit differently. Let me just show you, tell you how we treat them at UMass Amherst. So first, an outside scholarship will fill on that need. Okay. So financial aid cannot exceed need. Okay, so back to that formula, the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution equals the student's need for financial aid. So regardless of the source, financial aid cannot exceed the need. So at UMass Amherst, the first thing that we will do is fill on that need with any outside scholarships. Typically, incoming freshmen will come in with a lot more scholarships, outside scholarships than upper class students, unless they have like a four year merit scholarship. The next thing that an outside scholarship at UMass Amherst will do is either reduce down a loan or the federal work study. And we'll ask the students, what do you prefer? Do you want us to reduce down your work study or do you want us to reduce down your loan? Okay. But some schools, and then if only if we have to, will an outside scholarship replace some of the institutional grant money that we've awarded to the student. But some schools, an outside scholarship automatically will reduce down a grant that the school has awarded to them. So the question that you want to make sure that you know the answer to is how does your institution treat outside scholarships, particularly if you think your son or daughter is going to be receiving um, <clears throat> merit scholarships or a lot of outside scholarships upon graduation. Okay? I think we're good. So now we're at the point where we're comparing award letters. Okay. So we've got that cost of attendance of $30,000. We know the expected family contribution is $5,000. So the total eligibility for financial aid is $25,000. So we've got college A, B, and C. And you can see 
that the student loans are the same, the 5500 that's $3,500 of a subsidized loan and $2,000 of an unsubsidized loan. That's the maximum federal loan that a freshman can be afforded. And then we've got that work study of $1,500. $1,500 of work study for an incoming freshman is, is a pretty typical award, okay? But you can see that the grants and scholarships at, school, at college A, B, and C are different, okay? And this just gives you an idea so that you can forecast um, what you're looking at. And there's a really nice grid that uh, MIFA has that you can load in all this information so that you can keep track and, and actually um, make that comparison. Okay. So the next slide, we're um, comparing the whole thing again. So we've got college A, B, and C. You see that the, the grants are completely different. College A is giving $15,000 in grants. College B is giving $5,000 and college C is giving none. So um, this could be an example of someone, uh, college A, the student might have some merit scholarship money that they awarded to him. College C might be the student who applied late for financial aid, so he got no grant money. Um, but that's just something that you want to compare. So you're looking at the student loan that is the same across all those, the schools. You're looking at the work study that's the same. But the important takeaway from this slide, the reason that this is here, not only is to forecast for you what the changes could be if somebody is on time versus a late applicant, but you're also seeing that line there that forecasts a parent loan. So that parent loan is a credit-based loan. So at that school, there's probably no one that need. Where is that one? Okay. So you're seeing the different kinds of unmet need at those schools. So the student was a late applicant for financial aid and got no grant money, but they threw in a big plus loan, parent loan for undergraduate students, which is a credit-based loan. So beware of any schools that are meeting full need. Um, and to meet that full need, they're forecasting your eligibility for a, a plus loan, a parent loan for undergraduate students. That plus loan is a credit-based federal loan program um, that parents apply for, and it helps you finance that cost of education, but it certainly is not anything that they want to be putting in your financial aid award letter to meet need. Okay. How to fill that on that need. So, um, you know, I always talk about this in my presentations, and um, we, we now have it as part of the slides talking about the past, the present, and the future when you're financing a college education. So, the important thing that you're thinking about here not only is the past, the present, and the future, but remember that you're doing this, um, it could be for two years, it could be for four years. Uh, in my daughter's case, it's a five-year program. She's in a five-year program. Um, you want to think about the fact that when you're making your decision about what college to attend, that you're thinking about how many years into the future you're going to be doing this. And will there be more children in the family that will be coming up through the ranks um, that you're going to be financing their cost of education? So factor that into your decision. And then if you're thinking about how you're going to finance uh, paying for college, use a combination of the past, the present, and the future. The past, if you've got a 529 college savings account, um, how you're going to use that. If you put aside some, some savings uh, for college, how do you plan on using those past savings to finance a college education? The present. I always say to families, make sure that you're accepting that financial aid, even if it's a loan and work study, that work study, we've talked about how it helps fund those indirect expenses. And those student loans, the, the federal loan programs, do carry a lower interest rate than any loan that you can get on your own. Um, and then think about maybe enrolling in the, the, a payment plan. Most, if not all schools, have payment plans. UMass has a 10-month payment plan. It costs $50 to enroll into that 10-month payment plan, and five payments go to the fall semester and five payments go to the spring semester. You decide how much you want to enroll into that payment plan, but it helps you defer those costs 
over 10 payments, you're not paying for it. Think about how much you're willing to write a check when that bill comes to you. Most schools are going to send you a bill in the fall, for fall semester. Uh, at UMass Amherst, the bills go out in July and they're due in August. And you need to make sure that you pay the bill on time, because if you don't pay the bill on time, there'll be a hold on their ability to move in, register for classes, um, do anything, access the meal plan. Uh, so you want to make sure that you have a plan in motion for paying that bill when it comes out because chances are they're going to give you about a month's notice to pay the bill. So after you've thought about the past and the present, then you can move on and think about the future if you still have some outstanding balance that you have to pay. So you want to think about what's important to you in terms of looking at those credit-based loans, alternative financing options is how we, we um, name them at UMass Amherst. Um, so you want to think about who will be the applicant. Is it the parent? Is it the student? Don't be thinking that that student is going to be applying for a credit-based loan on their own because even if they do have a little bit of credit built up, most of those loan programs are tiered based on your, your um, credit score. So obviously you're going to be paying a much higher interest rate on a credit-based loan. So think about, are you looking for a loan with the shortest term, the longest term? Do you have some credit issues that you need to be sensitive about? For example, if you're applying for the parent loan for undergraduate students, and you are denied that loan because of credit, then the student becomes eligible for an additional four or $5,000 of unsubsidized direct student loans, depending on what their grade level is. Um, so you can be applying for different loans depending on what your ability to borrow is, but there are many different credit-based loans out there um, that parents and students can borrow to help finance the cost of education. Okay, I think we can move on. So let's talk a little bit about the Federal Student Loan Program because obviously this is, most students do have borrow a uh, federal direct student loan, the student is the borrower. There's no credit check. Uh, the annual limits, so freshmen are eligible for $3,500 of a subsidized loan and $2,000 of unsubsidized loans. Sophomores become eligible for $4,500. Juniors and seniors are eligible for $5,500 of a subsidized loan. And they all of the grade levels have that $2,000 of unsubsidized loan. The interest rate is fixed at 3.8% for this year. And then there are different um, repayment options. A really good website that you want to go on to in terms of uh, forecasting repayment and just general information is studentloans.gov, www.studentloans.gov. Um, there's repayment calculators out there, so you can forecast if they borrowed the maximum loan for four years, how much would they be paying back? Um, yeah? There's, there's a lot of the, so the question is about each year the interest rate may be different, but then at the end it's impossible to pay back all of these different loans separately. And so what happens is the student can do loan consolidation. And so when they are doing that loan consolidation, there is one rate that is applied to all of those different, to all of the different loans combined, and that is part of the loan consolidation. Um, and it depends on what the interest rate is at the time if the student is going to do loan consolidation. But there's lots of information on that studentloans.gov website about loan consolidation and repayment. There's lots of, I think there's five different repayment options that students can do um, through the federal student loan programs. Okay, okay we can move on. Be a wise consumer. 
this is this is really important that you make sure that you know the interest rates, you know who the borrowers, you know when the loan payments or, or the repayment or will begin and end, um, and what the monthly repayments amounts are. Uh, be a wise consumer. Um, this is where I also like to tell families that just beware of any scholarships. So where there's money, there's fraud. So make sure that you are not going on to FAFSA.com to fill out your free application for federal student aid. If you find yourself on FAFSA.com as opposed to FAFSA.gov, you're going to pay about $100 to fill out that free application for federal student aid. Um, any scholarship that's charging you a fee to apply for it, um, be cautious because scholarships should be free. Okay, you shouldn't have to pay a fee. I know a lot of families will hire someone to help them fill out that FAFSA form. Um, you know, there's lots of different companies out there that will guide families in the admission and financial aid process, and families pay sometimes a really exorbitant fee, but. You can always contact any financial aid professional in any financial aid office, and we will give you the same advice for free. You know, you don't need to be a student at UMass Amherst or applying to UMass Amherst to call into the financial aid office and ask for free help. We're always willing to help whoever gives us a phone call and has questions. Um, and then a lot of colleges host all kinds of information sessions for prospective students from uh, the admission process all the way through to the acceptance process and after. There is free information that is available at all colleges. You don't have to pay for it. We can move on. So um, that's the day. So that's the day. Um, I host that along with um, Kate Gentile from Amherst College. And we are the co-chairs for the Fast the Day um, site at Amherst Regional High School. It is on January 23rd at 7 o'clock. You do need to register to attend that. And basically, it is another um, session that we help families fill out their financial aid application. Okay. So I know the place is usually mobbed. <laughs> So if you plan on going to that session, you want to make sure that you register early because the site usually gets closed down because so many families are interested in going to that. And you go on to register at fastaday.org. Okay. There are about 25 different sites throughout the state. Yeah. Yeah, that's Sunday. So um, the federal fast today is January 26th, which is a Sunday. But we like to shake it up a little bit in Western Mass, and so we do it on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock because that's, that's the, the day that works for us. But there are also, uh, if you want to attend it, there are different sites across the state. Some of them, there are others that are on Thursday night, and then there are others, again, that are on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. Okay. Who do you recommend this now? ASAP. You can do it now. It's open right now. Um, and then there are these great workshops that meet the host. It's called After the Acceptance Seminar. So you bring your uh, financial aid award letters and you bring your acceptance letters and they help you navigate that awful decision. I understand there are quite a few tears at that session because the reality of paying for college collides with where they want to go. Okay. And so there are financial aid professionals that work with MIFA staff and help you navigate all those different financial aid award letters and help you make it reach a decision about what school to um, put your deposit at. So what you can do right now, you can sign up for the, e the MIFA email, you can download that ebook, you can bookmark the mifa.org slash seniors, and the big takeaway from this pr presentation is you can do it. You can do it. I know it seems a little bit overwhelming, but Hopefully now you're armed with a lot of information um, and you're ready to get out there and start doing some of the things that you need to start doing. It's not anything.
So now, if you can take a moment and complete your evaluation forms. Um, we actually mail these evaluation forms into MIFA and they take notes on me. Yeah. The question is, if I have an IVA account, do they take that into consideration? No, that is your retirement. But this year's contribution is considered um, one of the questions that you must complete. So this year's contribution into your IRA gets uh, calculated towards that expected family contribution. Okay, more questions? Uh, you're just IRS.gov. Okay, so when you when you fill out your FAFSA form and you're changing it from actual from estimated to actual tax data, you're going to be presented with five different questions. If you can answer those questions successfully, then you will and you want to be linked to the IRS. You'll be linked right up to the IRS website. Answer to the IRA is this year's contribution is considered on tax income. <coughs> no, doesn't get counted. Yeah. Oh, very good question. Does the, <coughs> does the FAFSA consider the non custodial parent? No. It's only the custodial parent, but if that custodial parent has remarried, it would be the custodial parent and their spouse. Okay. <clears throat> oh, are you saying that the household is So the question is, in a divorced household, is it one or both parents? Is it where the child? It is whoever is the custodial parent completes that FAFSA form. And the custodial parent would be whoever the student lives with the most. If there is joint custody, it's whoever provides the most support. And that parent would complete the FAFSA form. More questions? Yeah. Certificate of Mastery is with the Jan John and Abigail Adams, they need to maintain a 3.0 GPA and they can use it, they don't have to use it immediately upon graduation from high school. With the Stanley Coppock Certificate of Mastery, the GPA requirement is 3.2 and they must use it immediately upon graduation from high school. So if they go somewhere else and then come back to a state institution, they're not eligible. Yeah. 
like a you know a college education. Because I know somebody told me California is a state requirement. So the question is, is there a, is it a legal obligation? Is is it a legal obligation? Um, no, actually it's not. And there is there is a question on the FAFSA form that says that my parents will not contribute. But that student is only eligible for an unsubsidized direct student loan. They're not eligible for financial aid. And um, all of the questions, there's about, I think, 11 or 13 questions on the FAFSA form that dictate whether or not parents' information is required on the FAFSA form. Are you 24, married, an orphan ward of the court, a graduate student, a veteran, um, at risk of being homeless, an emancipated minor? Um, if you can't answer yes to any of those questions, then you must complete the FAFSA form with parents' information. Okay. More questions? Well, if you have some questions that you want to ask me privately, I will stick around for a while. And thank you all for inviting me here tonight. And I hope you have good luck with your college and financial aid process. Thank you.